Yes? Very good. Um, so I'd like first to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, to address the audience this afternoon. Um, so I will tell you a bit more what we have been doing in Itrix. So Itrix is an IMI project in Europe, uh, which aims to provide um, software support for a number of, of, of uh, EU programs looking at, at clinical trials and, uh, and healthcare. So I'm seconded, I'm funded by Roche. Uh, I'm based at the University of Oxford at the uh, EE Research Center. Um, where I, I manage a number of, of projects uh, uh, revolving around data management and, and curation. So, but before starting, I would like to thank, acknowledge all the people I've been working with over this project. Um, so the people in, in our team in Oxford, so Susanna, the group leader, uh, Alejandra, uh, Milo, Eamon, and, 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 and Peter, uh, at Roche, um, Michael Braxentaler, and, and uh, Martin Romacca, um, Fabien Richard, mainly at CNRS and uh, ESIB uh, in France. Uh, Ibrahim Hemam, who presented yesterday um, uh, the Biospeak DB at Imperial. And Paul Houston and Dorina uh, Brad Filin at CDISC, who did a fantastic work uh, on, on this one. Um, and of course, uh, Andrea Stillman and, and the group at the University of Luxembourg and all the people from, from Matrix. Um, so really what we are trying to, to, to play around and, and, and work at is to make data fair, to make things fair. And this is a key word you've heard about. Um, and basically this is a, uh, it simply means that we need to make the data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. The paper was published in Nature Scientific Data uh, earlier this year. Uh, you've got a link over here. And, and basically what it means is that we need to turn uh, the data sets into the new currency of, of modern data science. Um, publications is so 21st, 20th century and basically we need to, to live in our century and this is the, the new uh, asset that, are, that needs to be properly managed and, and distributed uh, because this is what uh, is the, actually the ore that we are mining constantly and we have to look after this. And uh, I will go uh, into uh, each individual element to see how this play um, in, in a kind of curation practice that you need to, to, to address. And uh, the good thing is that we are in San Diego today and it allows me to talk about another project I'm involved in. Um, but before going there, I just want to mention that um, uh, these uh, FAIR principles have not been endorsed by OECD. Uh, it was um, uh, following the G20 meeting in China, in Hangzhou, uh, earlier in September this year, where you can see uh, that this is really high on the agenda of, of, uh, of um, the, the, the leaders of uh, industrial countries. And we have more information in this statement, about this statement in this uh, PDF here. So um, what, about, what does it mean about finding data? Uh, and I think this is um, I want, what I wanted to mention about this um, uh, Data Med project, that is an uh, NIH project, uh, Big Data to Knowledge, uh, a collaboration uh, with people at the USCSD, San Diego, so Lucy um, uh, Ono Machado and uh, Jeff Greta, who was around yesterday. And basically, uh, this is what we're trying to do is to build a PubMed for data sets. Here, this is a kind of prototype interface that we have built, and it uh, against an aggregator of a number of, of databases uh, that can be queried in one simple interface and allows you to have a kind of uh, 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 overview of what is available for a particular domain uh, and across the different databases um, uh, in one single uh, stop shop. So that's, that's kind of the vision. Uh, we have a lot more work to be, uh, to be doing, uh, however, a number of principles uh, to make data findable have been uh, elucidated, and, and this is a kind of a big lesson that, that we would like to communicate about. And in a way, we have a lot of pressure from all sides to, to make data accessible as well. Uh, there is not a week almost that there is a paper uh, in Nature or otherwise to calling for making data uh, op completely open and, ac and accessible. Uh, this is another uh, publication last year um, to, to, to calling for the funders to encourage data to share a bit more their data sets. And when we mean um, making data accessible and, and shareable, we need to look at this kind of uh, concept that we need to understand about what kind of data modalities we are talking about, how can we describe those modalities so that they can be exposed and visible. So here we need to understand the kind of content that the data set uh, um, is about the kind of aggregation uh, qualifier that we can um, um, understand, uh, the kind of refinement, what kind of level of data we are, uh, we are currently exposing. Is it raw data? Is it compressed? Is it, you know, this kind of uh, summarized data sets? 
And of course, we need also to understand the availability and privacy um, 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 information about this data set. But it's not only the, the only thing. We need to understand how this data set is available and how it is, it is distributed. And here we have got an, another set of properties that we need to qualify or to document about the data in terms of access type, authorization, authentication, and various uh, uh, descriptors about the formats uh, so to, uh, to inform downstream uh, analysis tools about how uh, the data should be consumed, for instance. So that's, I'm touching on, on two points about the FAIR principles about making the data findable and accessible. Um, and again, this is also uh, because what we want to do with the data, uh, we want to check them out, of course. We trust the guys that are producing the data sets, but we like also to mine uh, these data sets ourselves and, and investigate um, uh, the content. And so this is um, something that you're probably aware of. This is Retraction Watch. And basically, you don't want to end up here um, um, unless you do the work yourself. Uh, but um, basically, this is the case where uh, a lot of analyses are, in a way, debunked or uh, bad papers are, are, are identified. And sometimes it it's, it's it's overflows on, on the, on, on the, it makes the headline. Uh, so you don't want your science to be, to be ending up in, in New York Times for the wrong reasons. Um, but going back to the work that we do in Atrix and to expose this data, what we have been doing so far is working the translational area. This is the kind of big challenge because we need to reconcile a number of cultures uh, because we need to move from the basic science uh, from a bench to bench side, that's the first step of translation, but also uh, from the bench side to the practice. And uh, this is again making the data and the information, the evidence that has been collected and gathered through uh, basic research and clinical trials uh, available to the, uh, the neural practice. And this is uh, usually a, a very long path. Um, so we need to encompass a range of, of domains, which are kind of, uh, uh, as I said, um, looking at different cultures, basically. We are talking at different people. Uh, in the world of clinical data, the CDISC form standards are ruling, but we, we need also to go into non-clinical data, uh, animal in vitro uh, data sets, which may not be described in the same way. Uh, we have also data intensive molecular phenotyping data that are coming along. And again, we've got different resources and we can contrast uh, the kind of culture again, I mentioned, uh, between what is uh, the standards produced by standard uh, development organizations, which are extremely structured uh, compared to maybe less, more academic uh, um, um, efforts, uh, which are maybe not as involved with the industry, uh, but more oriented towards the, the academics. And this leads to some kind of inconsistency across domains. And one of the big problem is the transloading uh, that we, we may face every time we need to move from one world to the next. And do this uh, during the, tr the transition between domains. And this is a, a very expensive exercise. So uh, now we're we'll talking about uh, the I in the FAIR principles, which is the interoperability problem. And I found this um, headline, which was kind of interesting to see. I think it's very illustrative of the problem we're facing. Uh, basically, this is the kind of problem of uh, transportation of information uh, here of goods, but we are facing the problem of transporting data across systems. And when we have to change uh, uh, all the material, the ore, from one train to the next, just because the gauge are not the same, then, then it's, it's really expensive. And it, I felt it was kind of a good image of the kind of uh, data intensive uh, process that every time we need to transfer to convert from format to format, uh, the cost uh, of, this, uh, of this activity is, and we should be doing other things than just doing this. Um, so really, and when we, the, the problem of the gauge and changing uh, gauge is, is, is basically illustrated. It happens many, many times over. For each of these domains, there will be many, many different formats and that are maybe competing. And, uh, and therefore, we need to have a good understanding of what is available there uh, in the wild before maybe inventing a new standard or, or just learning to use them. So we need to learn how to use the resource. And, and this is basically the main exercise of the work uh, done by Etrix with the work package three to carry out this survey uh, of the existing um, uh, among the standards. And basically, what for, for scientists having to comply with all these standards, the, the base people are extremely uh, um, distressed somehow when, they, when we are told uh, you have to comply with this standard. And this experience is based, illustrated by, by the feeling that, that this um, uh, mariner probably has. Um, so we started about two years ago 
uh, assembling this group of people, um, uh, Fabien Richard, Paul Houston, Michael Braxton Teller, and Susanna Sansone, at the uh, annual meeting in Barcelona in 2014, uh, decided, well, we need to do something about, about this work. And basically, uh, this, these are all the people that have been involved along, over the years. Um, uh, Martin Romaca, Dorina Bratfalin, I don't have pictures, unfortunately, but uh, uh, involved in a project. And we released the starter pack, uh, release one, in Berlin in October 2014, and since then I've, I've upgraded the, 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 the document uh, to, to, um, to reflect the change in the evolution in standards. So of course we, are, uh, we have to place in the context of Transmart, because this is a tool that is uh, uh, the engine for, for the data uh, management and processing, and we have to support a number of format of, of projects. We started with that four project, but at, at, as of today, I need to update my number. We have more than 40 projects involved uh, with eTrix and somehow supported by the different tools and, and working groups. So we are actually at the top of this triangle and we are interacting with two work packages. One is the software and engineering development, work package two, and then of course the other one, which is um, uh, the uh, curation and preservation uh, work package. And in a way, our job is to uh, recommend standards that can be therefore uh, used to specify tools and, and these groups here are interacting to enforce the requirements and build the capability to comply with the, any uh, recommendation that we have made produced. So um, how do we go about surveying the existing? So we relied on, on a registry which is pretty cool, which is BioSharing Registry, uh, um, which in a way is a catalog of registry of standards and resources from vocabularies to uh, terminologies to databases and policies and, and formats. And basically it gives a kind of typology of standard depending whether you talk about reporting guidelines such as Miami or Consort, how much information do you need to report to make your data really reusable? And this is the main, pro the main concern of this minimum guidelines. It's not to be an, another uh, constraint, but just to make sure that people have provided uh, enough information. Um, as a sideline, I was curating data sets on metabolic profiling, for instance, recently, and accessing a twin study in a public repository um, about a court about 2,000 patients. It was impossible to tell which uh, twin were uh, twin with the other one. So basically, immediately, we have a problem of, of a reuse of the data. So even though it's accessible and public, it's not reusable. And, and basically, the, the, the key of the guidelines is just to address that problem. Uh, then we've got a number of exchange formats. These are, in a way, the syntax elements that we need to comply with or to be aware of when a community has specified a, a particular syntax to uh, message information such as gene expression, we, we may want to uh, uh, implement it. And this is important because complying with this information or the, with the syntax allows to, uh, to retain the data set in a kind of dormant stage, like the seed that we can always go back to to uh, load the data back into a system. Because system evolves, they may die, they may lack funding in long term, so the system disappears, but the data set will be still available in this kind of seed form. And we need to be able always to understand uh, the format and to have the tools to manipulate it so that we can still uh, vivify it and, and populate the database. Uh, we've all also, of course, listed all the vocabularies and terminologies. This is the kind of axis that I'm representing here that are, in a way, giving the kind of directions, main branches of the repository of, of biosharing. And uh, we organize also the standards by scope, depending on the domain of acquisition of the data, uh, the content types. And basically what we build is a kind of kind of map of standards. And this is what we, we happen. We, we realize that um, a, a number of standards are competing in the same niche. And, and basically we've got contact points as well, which can be sometimes source of friction between communities and we need to bridge these gaps and to, to, to make uh, links between communities or crosstalk uh, to avoid, again, the problem of transloading. So I think, again, uh, another important aspect of the, uh, the biosharing repository is the fact that it provides a kind of uh, a first insight into the metrics that could be used to uh, assess the uptake of a standard by linking um, uh, standards to resources, to databases which are actually implementing the standards. So this gives a, a feel for, just by interrogating these repositories, how many resources are using actually uh, uh, the, the MageTab format, for instance, or a soft format from GI. And again, it gives you uh, how many resources are using Go. 
it gives you a feel about uh, how you, you should inform your data management policies when you start a project uh, and, and document those steps. So for the startup pack, we have defined a number of selection criteria uh, for, for instance, this is the example of the selection criteria we have used to select vocabulary or to recommend ones. And we've got a number of course to, uh, uh, we can, I don't have time to go into the details exactly, but we, we have a number of elements uh, which are important, such as the licensing information, whether you, can, uh, you have enough documentation, uh, whether terms have definition, the depth and breadth. So you can, you can really uh, use those metrics to, uh, to define and, and make educated choice in terms of resources that you are, you are using. And again, it's to familiarize people uh, data manager with a resource they intend to use because it has an impact either over the long-term uh, sustainability of the data and the preservation of it and the reuse. Uh, so these are a set of, again, other exclusion criteria for the selection of, of standards that you can apply uh, when you define your, your data management policy. The, the standard setup pack and the different versions are available from Zenodo. You've got the DOIs, um, I can go quickly. Just quickly over the organization, we've split the document between clinical standards. We just recommend CDISC format. I will go over that quickly. Uh, and then from the non-clinical studies from the omics standards, like high dimensional um, uh, molecular phenotyping. And uh, another dimensions is the recommendation for vocabularies. So here we've got a stack of CDISC standard that we want to implement and recommend through uh, eTrix. And I will show how it has been enacted in Transmart by building specific master trees. Uh, that was a, a work carried out by Dorina Bratfalin and Adriano uh, uh, Balboa Silva at Luxembourg. Um, here, we also have to be aware of the FDA, uh, the regulator rules for using a certain number of, of resources. This again, informs the drive that you have to, to take and the path that you have to take in, in your data management policies. Here, it's a busy table, I'm sorry, I uh, apologize for this, but this is giving uh, kind of an overview of the kind of omic data uh, recommendations that are available. And again, this is searchable through the biosharing interface uh, because we've got an eTwix collection uh, that allows you to query this, this interface instead of uh, parsing this, this, this spreadsheet. So I can go quickly on this one. Now I will touch upon the implementation. So, okay, we've got a document that lists a number of resources, but also we wanted to uh, eat our own dog food and see how easy it is to move this into uh, actionable elements. So uh, we wanted to build the Etrix harmonization system, and basically it has three components. Uh, one component is a database which corresponds to the repository. This is the Biospeak DB that uh, Ibrahim presented yesterday. But we also wanted to build a, a curation knowledge base. That was the kind of uh, driving force of all the efforts by Fabien Richard to, to have this uh, built. And we also needed, we realized we needed a metadata registry, uh, kind of vocabulary server to store the common data elements that we were uh, accessing. And again, this was a service that we needed to develop for our users uh, who ne not necessarily wanted to access uh, public servers for those vocabularies. So for the metadata registry, we reviewed a number of resources and we eventually narrowed down to two elements, Bioportal and OLS version 3. And uh, we finally set up, uh, decided to go for uh, OLS version 3, which is available as Docker container, very easy to deploy, and then we can load <coughs> a number of resources that we've identified um, at will. Uh, now, for the curation uh, knowledge base, this was a kind of harder nut to crack because one of the key um, elements, how do, you, do, we, do we really address the key bottleneck in data curation, which is uh, every time we have a new data set, we need to start from scratch again, and we have lost uh, maybe the knowledge that, that has been, uh, if we have seen a variable already, um, how we can uh, exploit this, this knowledge to the system to learn slowly. Uh, so we look at a system that was develop being developed at EBI, which is called Zuma. Uh, you've got a link to, to GitHub. Um, and it looks like this, basically. It's a very simple interface, but behind this, you've got um, um, uh, storage um, of all the information that a curator at the Express have been um, uh, en encountering and replacing and, and fixing. So basically, there is a kind of um, element of uh, curation experience that is built in by loading uh, the elements that have been uh, cleared. So, uh, so long you comply with the same curation policies at EBI, you could also reuse the content of uh, EBI resources. However, um, of course, 
uh, EBI as its own resources, and this might not be uh, compatible with, uh, for instance, the CDS compliance elements. So we need to uh, load our own sets of elements. So this is the cost uh, for the system to really operate efficiently. We need to load more data sets, which will have, um, in a way, uh, slowly aggregating the curation knowledge. And basically, this is now where we get uh, to uh, this kind of, uh, I think I will skip this slide because uh, Ibrahim presented. I just wanted to mention this because this is a, a kind of nice component building on top of all, all these elements which constitutes the kind of data repository of clean data. Um, and you can see the different architecture, the different components uh, working together uh, where the BiospeakDB DB access the metadata registry and the knowledge base, uh, the curation knowledge base to build uh, templates which are somehow here. The templates are organized according to the CDs domains, so which is a, a kind of interesting implementation of the CDs that are in action in a tool uh, that is already usable. Uh, so one of the aspects is to move uh, the data from a, uh, a, a the curation from a retrospective activity to almost a prospective one uh, by, of course, allowing people to create a templates at planning stage and evaluate um, uh, and really set out the course of data collection uh, in a standard compliant way. Um, just a few elements of visual analytics in, built in the tool also because it's important to build rewards when, when people are, are collecting data. I'll skip, skip this uh, quite quickly, ask Ibrahim for more information uh, about the tool. Um, but what I wanted to um, Yes, to mention here is also uh, working with Transmart to build the CDS compliant uh, standard master tree. Uh, this is Adriano and Dorena. Uh, this is basically the tree of life for Transmart uh, when you talk to standards. Um, another element here, like the kind of connection between the BiospeakDB DB and the Transmart master tree. So uh, built in into Ibrahim's tool, you've got the ability to export uh, the data that has been stored into um, into BiospeakDB into a completely uh, compatible master tree into transport and load that into transport for for visual analytics. So going back to uh, the, the evolution of standards, uh, we have also uh, identified a number of gaps, and that we are still trying to identify solutions for. In particular, uh, we we have a problem of identifying or notifying the uh, recording. Um, anything related to LC issues in our data sets and we would like also to probably uh, have a better description of our statistical results that we could be also uh, be exposed for queries. And also we have two um, elements, to, we need to track the evolution of standards, there are new uh, efforts and new um, um, the specifications is a big issue that we need to pay attention to. The CDISC pharmacogenomics element uh, first specification has been has been released, and we we have we have been evaluating it, and also the GA4GH, so the Global Alliance for Genomic Health, um, which met about two weeks ago now uh, in Vancouver, and which I will tell you a bit more uh, in a minute, uh, will have a, a kind of important impact. So. This is a kind of resources that we are developing in Oxford, which is about the statistics, uh, just to, to, again, to have a better orientation of, of the results. I can skip on that quickly. What I wanted to mention here is kind of relevant for the audience is the, um, uh, the adoption by the GA4GH metadata element of the Fino data packet, uh, the Fino packet uh, model. Uh, you can go to this, um, to this um, uh, link here to have a lot more information. I don't have time now to, to dip. Uh, deeper into this uh, specification. However, this is uh, a format specified to report phenotypes and uh, it will re rely heavily on the human phenotype ontology uh, to describe uh, the traits that you observe in patients. And uh, there is really a paper by Peter Robinson, Chris Mungle and Melissa Endel about capturing uh, phenotype for precision medicine. Uh, the publication is linked here. And um, just to give you um, uh, a reason why this is important, uh, yesterday Troy Heidecker mentioned, was describing the, the, the use of data-driven uh, ontology building and how um, this uh, representation will really change the way we, we, we process the, uh, the human, um, our understanding of human diseases. This is a paper that is uh, uh, published by uh, uh, the Bridge BDP, so Blood Platelet Disorder Consortium in the UK, which uh, basically uses data which has been produced by uh, the pilot project of the 100,000 uh, Genome Project in the UK, and which uh, has 
for a number of, uh, of cases, have defined a uh, phenotypic annotation for each of the patient and cluster that uh, uh, in, in this figure, basically, and you identify um, a set of um, similar phenotypic description that redefines the kind of pathology that, that are related to, that have been classically defined and, and, and really uh, provides a better understanding of what kind of clinical signs you could expect for particular, uh, you can associate to particular disorders. And, and of course, this, uh, this is a, a major uh, development that we need to, to keep a, a close eye on. And in a way, one last thing about uh, this kind of sea of standards that in a way, the main message that we, we, we can hope for is to build, uh, to build some kind of community engagement for around curation. But above all, official endorsement drives uh, the adoption of standards. So we need probably as a community to call for a stronger mandate by funding agencies. Uh, but also by regulatory agencies, <laughs> by uh, publishers, and, and by, uh, I'm showing here scientific data and, and bio um, and giga science, um, but also uh, to work closer with patient groups to uh, have a more active lobbying so that uh, all these players really have a stronger mandate in which standards we, we, we can uh, rely on and should be mandated so that there is a business uh, case for developing tools that support those standards. At the moment, there is, it's too loose, way too loose, and basically uh, everybody picks the one they want and, and it doesn't help. So it's too much fragmentation. And so basically we need to, to do this a bit more um, efficiently. So the last point is that I, I think that was a, a kind of an important aspect also to, to create a, a sense of community of curation. We've got many companies here today represented over the last few uh, uh, days and we're all doing the same thing. However, we don't share the knowledge of the curation. And I think that's for specific therapeutic areas, this could really be a game changer and talking more uh, among each other and about the preferences, the efficiency of some resources over others, we could also again uh, put a ranking of which solution work or maybe suited for uh, specific problems and also document some of the patterns, coding patterns within specific spec uh, syntax, for instance, that work or are efficient for specific study designs. Uh, that we will have a section about that right after me. Uh, and basically to make sure that we make data sets uh, reusable, almost plug and play, because this is what makes the value. Uh, and finally, ideally, we should move away from the kind of retrospective data management that we are often uh, have to do to a prospective, uh, so building better tools so that the data capture system are uh, implementing standard at a very, very early stage. And I will stop here and take any questions. Thank you for your time. working. So for those of you who might have snoozed, because Philip has delivered so much information in such a short time, um, Starter Pack is available on, on the Transmart Foundation website. And this is the only actually standards recommendation that we have so far through the foundation. So, um, and it includes recommendations for the ontology and for the terminology use and also recommendation for the Transmart Master Tree design. Okay, and the questions that I have, on one of your slides uh, you had FDA requirements, MEDRA, WHO, and those, not, those are not the, the ontologies that you actually recommend in your starter pack because they are not free. Correct. So how do you go about sharing data or making them accessible or merging studies together when you have some study that we're using uh, the fair ontologies and some study that we're going by the FDA uh, requirements? Yeah, that's a very good question and in a way this is what I try to refer to the kind of cultural clashes that, that we have to face in the curation world. So I, I don't have an easy answer. I, th I think that for all the uh, the people operating in, in, in a regulator, regulated environment that will have to comply uh, with all the elements. And we will probably have to rely on mappings. There was a Pistoia initiative on, on ontology mapping that could also allow us to, 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 to reconcile some of these, um, these problems and by providing bridges between uh, resources annotated 
with one set of, of resources and another one. Okay, so you probably can envision some kind of um, plug-in into Transmart that will have all ontologies cross-mapped. That could be, that could be, but it's a huge challenge because of course it, 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 it ontology evolves and it, it's not a nice thing to, to maintain. So uh, it has in, in itself a huge uh, uh, hoverhead. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's interesting also to cross compare with, uh, on that point, with the OMOP and Odyssey community. Because right. they have about 80 standards, um, more on medical data, it's only clinical data, but it's already mapped to each other. And within the Odyssey community, they are maintaining this uh, together. Right. And I would love to have something like that in Transmart as well. Okay. Um, so just to add one more thing, because right now in Transmart, the support for really um, tying your concepts to, for example, ontology terms is pretty limited. Yeah. We'll have some work in 17.1 to improve that, but how important I is that in your uh, vision, for example, in the Transmed UI, that you can actually see the underlying ontologies uh, or that you can even do cross-study searches? Um, because right now, I think with in the E-Tricks, the way you solve it is all that thing is done in EHS and Transmed just a bespoke rendering. Right, ideally, yeah. So I think for Transmart, I could see um, need for evolution would be where ontology could help is the way the query engine could be could be powered. You could you could envision query expansion to the same way it's already available from EBI resources, for instance. So uh, that would significantly improve um, data exploration and discovery of associations, uh, things that are not necessarily Im immediate to uh, to the scientist accessing. Uh, the, the resource. Another one, I, I mean, I think this is why I wanted to insist on, on, on the, um, um, the phenopacket specification uh, and the, um, uh, the human phenotype ontology, because I, I, I really believe that this is possibly a game changer uh, in, as, as the resource is, is, is showing uh, its promises. And it, it's been, um, in a way, at the moment, we are looking also at, at, at using this specification to encode molecular phenotypes. I'm thinking about metabolite profiling, for instance, and how could you capture this? And again, and this will be moving into very data-intensive uh, uh, phenotyping. So how do we bring this uh, into Transmart? Well, it's open, and, but I guess we, uh, the, the Transmart Foundation should definitely keep a, a close eye on this evolution. Hi, Philip. Uh, thanks for your talk. Great, uh, great materials. I've looked at the starter pack earlier, and then um, I liked what's in there, but indeed it's quite high level. So I really like the master trees because they're really right. applied. Um, and I had a quick look in the starter guide, and I only see some screenshots there of the master trees. Do you have the the editable files uh, ready to use somewhere available? Or right. I I believe they are on the on the e GitLab. So, but it is uh, somehow access restricted at the moment, but you should get in touch with Adriano and uh, the access should be granted uh, so with no difficulty, I think. So the one thing that we can, we can mention uh, somehow is that um, the, the, the CDS master tree may not correspond to um, the kind of um, scientific question people want to, to ask the data. So this is again something that may have to be considered. However, it definitely provides a consistent a standardized way of representing the, the studies so that you can cut across and possibly assemble cords in a very consistent way and, and s smoothly. But I, I, yes, that's in a way another step that we would like to work in the, in the next year is to, to move from the, the kind of uh, document to a more machine readable and adaptable, uh, uh, directly useful for to curators. But again, also engaging with the community, creating this kind of way to exchange curation experience uh, is something that, in a way, um, made us attend this meeting because I, I, I believe, strongly believe, believe that uh, we, we need the engagement of, of many, many, many different groups. Yeah, well, a uh, trade would love to be uh, involved. Right. Yeah, just to follow up for that, is it make sense to start to have like a collection of master tree or things like that on the Transmap guideline? Okay, I'll take that as an one action item back to the content group. Yep. Yeah, uh, and I think for uh, the safety one developments, we also think about, n then we're moving more uh, to uh, not study specific mapping, but really this cross-study cross generic uh, ontology trees like I2B2 has. 
awesome. I think then we can also reuse a lot what I2B is already has on. Uh, I think on BioPortal they have a uh, dedicated I2B to uh, um, part with uh, with already ontologies curated for the platform. Okay, that makes sense. I'll, I'll take that as one follow up. I actually Great. attempt to reach out to you know make sure we get some data files and some files from the Hive and other vendors Great. to see what collection we can start building there. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you.